LinkedIn presents. I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. Today, schools all over America struggle with a racial academic achievement gap. Can a small town in Ohio help us figure out how to close it? Labor Day weekend is upon us, which means that kids across the country are headed back to school, finally, from the perspective of this parent. And in light of that, we wanted to bring you a story about schooling in America. It's a story about race, integration, and equity, a story that's equal parts inspiring and dispiriting, a story with lessons that, if applied properly, could reshape American education for the better. Here's our producer, Kayla Bissinger, to tell you more. On May 17, 1954, the Supreme Court handed down a ruling that changed America. In a unanimous decision, the nine Supreme Court justices ruled racial segregation in publicly supported schools to be unconstitutional, declaring that it denied equal opportunity. He's talking, of course, about Brown versus Board of Education. Today, we remember that case as a watershed moment in the fight for civil rights. But what many of us don't remember, what we weren't taught, is that all over the country, the high court's decision was met with rage. In Tennessee, pro-segregationists blew up an elementary school because it admitted one black student, a six-year-old girl. In Virginia, officials decided they'd rather close schools than integrate them. So they shut down an entire school system for five years. In New York City, 10,000 white parents took to the streets to protest a plan that would have transferred a small number of students between predominantly black and Puerto Rican schools and white ones. And in Boston, where decades of discriminatory housing laws and racist covenants had resulted in highly segregated neighborhoods and therefore highly segregated neighborhood schools, a judge ordered the city to integrate with busing putting kids on school buses and sending black students to white schools and white students to black ones. This plan was so unpopular, it triggered more than 40 riots. Enraged white Bostonians attacked little black kids who were just trying to go to school. They were throwing eggs at the window and trying to hit people with them. And they was throwing, and while we was in school, they was throwing glass at black people and little kids. And then there was Shaker Heights, in Ohio. As battles over desegregation blazed across the country, this wealthy white suburb of Cleveland flipped the script. Residents didn't resist integration. They embraced it, first in their neighborhoods and then in their schools. In 1975, just one year after those black kids had eggs and glass thrown at them for just trying to go to class, the New York Times ran a front-page story about Shaker Heights with the headline, An Integrated Suburb Thrives in Ohio. In Shaker, the paper of record declared, black and white children grow up side by side, from toddler to teenager, acquiring friends of both races in one of the country's most dramatically successful long-term ventures in racial integration. But how successful was it? Shaker's decades-long pursuit to fulfill the promise of racial integration is the subject of a new book by Laura Meckler called Dreamtown, Shaker Heights and the Quest for Racial Equity. Laura grew up in Shaker. She graduated from its excellent high school, went on to attend one of the nation's best universities, and is now an education reporter at The Washington Post. Hers is a success story the broad outlines of which can be mapped onto the lives of numerous other white Shaker alums. But for black students, the story was often different. Yes, many of them achieved tremendous academic and professional success, but statistically, black kids at Shaker were more likely to be in remedial classes than advanced placement. And on the SAT, they scored on average 300 points lower than their white classmates. As Laura dug into her hometown's history, she found that 
For decades, Shaker schools had been balanced in terms of racial representation, but they weren't balanced in terms of academic outcomes. Now, I should point out that achievement gaps like this exist in schools all over the country. According to research from Stanford, the difference in standardized test scores between white and black students nationwide is the equivalent of two years of education. Two years. How do you close that gap? That's what they're trying to figure out today in Shaker Heights. They're implementing new education strategies aimed at shrinking the achievement gap. Strategies that, if successful, could be replicated in schools from coast to coast. Shaker Heights, the small city that defied the odds decades ago by embracing integration, is now realizing it didn't go far enough. And it's trying to redesign its schools as a result. Will it work? That's the question we're trying to answer this hour. Stay with us. The Anxious Achiever is the podcast about your mental health and your work, where leaders from top companies, entrepreneurs, athletes, celebrities, and leading experts share how they've managed through anxiety, depression, and other mental health challenges, and how they've become better leaders in the process. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll feel seen, and you'll learn great tools and skills. And I guarantee you're going to look at leadership in a new way. Come find out why we won the Mental Health America 2023 Media Award. Get The Anxious Achiever wherever you find your podcasts. Laura Meckler, welcome to the Next Big Idea podcast. Thank you so much for having me. You've got a new book out. It's called Dream Town: Shaker Heights and the Quest for Racial Equity. And it's centered on Shaker Heights, Ohio. This is a community outside of Cleveland. Paul Newman grew up there, and he called it the Cleveland suburb that every other American suburb aspired to be. You also grew up in Shaker Heights. What's it like? Paint us a picture of Shaker Heights. That's such a great Paul Newman quote. Shaker Heights is a beautiful community. It was very much a planned community. It was a garden suburb. It's made to feel like you are living not just near a park, but in a park. All the houses look similar and they're all of a certain quality. The roads follow the topography of the land. Um, so you have natural hills and little vales and you have curving streets. It's not just a grid. Very little commercial activity, a few little commercial centers, no industry. It is just a very meant to feel like a very elite is actually the way it was created. And it mm. feels that way too, because it's, you know, each little neighborhood has what was originally a school in there with a playground. Most of them are set on ovals. So the community feels like it's sort of encircling the center of that little neighborhood. I can't resist reading a few lines from this 1963 Cosmopolitan article that you quote <laughs> uh, in the book. The wealthiest suburb in the United States, Shaker Heights, boasts practically no unemployment, no slums, backyard swimming pools are commonplace, nearly everyone belongs to a country club, and most kids have new cars. Um, <laughs> What an what an idol. <laughs> I mean, I think at the time that article was criticized as over the top, and I suspect it was quite over the top, but the overall tone of it did ring true. So there's this great James Joyce line that was sort of reverberating in my head as, as I read your book. And he said, in the particular is contained the universal. And the particulars of your book obviously are Shaker Heights, the school system there, the challenge to integrate this community. And of course, the universal is that that experience of, of what happened in Shaker when they integrated, when they integrated the community, when they integrated the schools, has all these lessons that I think speak to America as a whole, that answer or attempt to answer all these questions that are still vexing us about how do we create communities that are racially diverse? How do we get along? How do we live together? Was that the project you had in mind when you set out to write this book? Did you see Shaker as a, as a microcosm that, that represented some of these bigger vexing questions uh, in the country as a whole? 
I mean, a hundred percent. I absolutely had that in mind, but it was sort of a, a twin thought. There was that, the idea that this is something that brings up the same questions, the same struggles that we see all over the place. And it's also sort of a story that is kind of remarkable in and of itself. So I felt like it was a story that was just fascinating to tell of how it unfolded here. Um, so it's sort of a little bit of a window into a place that you may not know anything about and also a mirror of a, that may really feel like a place that feels familiar. So let's start telling that story of Shaker Heights. I, I think first, maybe we should give listeners a really quick lesson on how housing segregation happened in 20th century America. You lay a lot of the blame at the feet of the federal government. Why is that? To make sure there was blame to go around, the, the the real estate industry and the banking industry did their part. But the National Housing Act, of this is a federal law passed in 1934, specifically introduced the practice of redlining. And what redlining was, was drawing lines on city maps to indicate which areas were essentially safe for investment and where mortgages could be written. And you know, as it happens, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, black neighborhoods were all outlined in red. So they were not, you, they were, the federal government was essentially telling banks, this is not a safe place to invest your money. So people could not get loans if it was a black neighborhood. So what did that do? That encouraged segregation because if you were a, a developer working in a predominantly white area or a fully white area, you're livelihood, your ability to detract investment depended on keeping it white because as soon as it became integrated, it would, would be redlined. So I don't think we can underestimate what a pernicious effect this had on the whole country in terms mm. of encouraging segregation. I think a lot of people think about housing segregation as, well, it's kind of how it happens. People want to live around people like themselves. And, you know, there's some truth to that for sure. But this was not just that. This was official policy. It was it was set from the top and it was um, spread across the country. And in addition to this government policy, this racist government policy, there were also all of these nefarious practices that realtors and lenders and residents of communities, residents of white communities, I should say, used to keep black people from moving in. I'm thinking about something like blockbusting. Talk about those for a minute. There were also covenants, which were restrictions written into deeds that prevented, in many cases, the sale of the property to somebody Black, to somebody Jewish, to somebody Chinese. There were all sorts of restrictions like that written into it. And before that, there were actually laws, municipal laws mandating segregation. So there was a lot, there were, this was layers and layers and layers. Then when we get to blockbusting, what that was about was less about keeping an area segregated, but what would happen once integration happened? What happens once a Black family gets into a white neighborhood? Mm -hmm. Well, then suddenly the incentives all flip and the realtors, instead of trying to keep Black people out, now they're like, well, that neighborhood has been breached, if that's how they might view it. So we're going to take advantage of that. And what we're going to do is we're going to scare every white family living there into moving. And now we have, and we have this, of course, enormous pent up demand from black buyers who can't get into nicer neighborhoods and they're ready to go. So the sometimes black and white realtors would work together, white realtors scaring people into selling and then black realtors producing the buyers. There are so many reports out there of people who would like Saturday mornings, their phone would just start ringing for sale signs up and down the street, working to scare people, even people who weren't inclined to leave, but they thought, well, gosh, am, am, am I going to lose this investment? They said, we have all our money in this house. What if, what if we lose our money? Like people were scared and they acted on those fears. And this leads, you say, to something called resegregation, right? So black families arrive, white families leave, and all of a sudden a community that was maybe starting to become integrated is no longer integrated anymore. I heard somebody once refer to integration as the period between segregation and resegregation. And this is where the Shaker Heights story gets so interesting because that's what's happening all over the country. And yet something different starts happening in the 1950s in Shaker Heights in this neighborhood called Ludlow. Tell me what happens when black families start moving into that historically white neighborhood. 
So the very first reaction was what was typical in white neighborhoods, which was um, there were, you know, quote unquote, concerned citizens who had a meeting at the elementary school to say, like, how can we stop this? Mm -hmm. Then something really extraordinary happened, which was the garage at a house that was being built for a black lawyer and his wife was bombed. And that really scared people. They were like, whoa, are, mm -hmm. is that what this is? This is what, this is not what we are about. We're not about violence. And then as more black families started to arrive into this neighborhood, some people there, both black and white families decided, you know what? We don't want the story of Ludlow to be the same story that we've seen everywhere else, which is just rapid white flight. So they did something kind of simple, but also kind of extraordinary. They got to know each other. They started out with like a barbecue. They formed block clubs where they would just get to know one another as people. And then that slowly developed into a more formal community association. And then soon after that, something really remarkable happened, which was they decided that if they were going to try to keep their neighborhood racially balanced, that was their goal. They wanted to keep racial balance in the neighborhood. They knew that left to its own devices, what the market would do, what the blockbusters would do, what the realtors would do, what the banks would do is keep white people out and bring black people in and the whole neighborhood would flip. So they decided to essentially replicate the services that were provided by the real estate industry. They started showing houses themselves. They started advertising the neighborhood as an integrated neighborhood. It's really remarkable and, and unusual at this this period in American history. Why Shaker? Like like why why did this happen in in Ludlow in Shaker Heights and not why was it not happening in you know the suburbs of Chicago or the suburbs of Philadelphia or the suburbs of New York? I honestly believe it has to do with just the people who happened to be there at that time mm. that were committed. And these were some extraordinary people, both black and white, who just wanted something different. And then somehow they got themselves organized and got this ball rolling. They had this ethos. I mean, they they knew they were up against it. You know, there was a, one of the women who was very active in the Ludlow Community Association told a story about how she... um you know, the banks wouldn't lend to Black people initially. You could not get a, a loan if you're a Black family trying to move into a white neighborhood. Well, once you became a white family trying to move into an integrated neighborhood, you couldn't get a loan. So there were all these pressures against it happening. And they decided, like, you know, screw that. They were going to really fight back. And I think what I think that they just kind of manifested success for themselves. I'm sure they didn't use that term, but that's kind of what it was like. They were like they started declaring success, telling the local papers they were succeeding when they just had tiny bits of success and it built. So Ludlow, this neighborhood in Shaker Heights, becomes sort of a shining national example of a, of a community that not just integrated, but sort of enthusiastically integrated itself. And its success, I think, is probably one of the factors that by the 1960s inspires Shaker Heights superintendent of schools to say, you know what, we need to make sure that all of the schools in Shaker are, are integrated too. This is a guy named John Lawson. And he proposes that the district should adopt something called one-way busing. How does that work? John Lawson, known universally as Jack, he arrives in the mid 60s and Shaker has already, in fact, gone beyond just the housing integration in Ludlow into other neighborhoods as black families are arrived. And the city itself has kind of started to change its identity and it's changed its thinking around that question of integration. OK, so he sees the situation in the schools. There's one elementary school called Moreland and it is 88 percent black students. He saw this. He saw around the corner and he said, you know what, this is not good for the kids at this school. His solution was, as you said, a one-way busing plan. He was going to take the Black children going to Moreland and send them to some of the white schools around Shaker Heights Elementary Schools. And then he was going to use the space in Moreland as what he called a special services school where kids from all over the district would rotate through and um, get all sorts of like special enrichment. And what happens next? Tell me if I'm getting this right, Laura, because if I am, it's really remarkable. What happens next is the community starts engaging with this plan and reviewing this plan. And they sort of say, you know what, this doesn't go far enough, right? Like we actually should have two-way busing. Is that is that what happens? 
It, it is. I mean, there are actually two things that happened. One is the Moreland community was furious about this. They didn't want one-way busing. They wanted a two-way busing plan. You know, they said those white schools are just as segregated as our school is, which was 100% true. When they protested, that was not enough to change the plan. But then some white people in Shaker said, why is it this way? Why is this a one-way plan? And this committee formed for, um, and what they did is this group of white parents said, not only do we support a two-way busing plan, but we volunteer our kids to be part of it. We will send our kids to Moreland and let Moreland kids come to our school. And that's ultimately the plan that was adopted in 1970. And it's so astonishing. I mean, this is, you know, for context, for listeners, this is four years before the famous riots in Boston over the busing, over school busing. And so not only do you have a community that is sort of ahead of the curve, but you also have a community that is asking for this, that is fighting for this, that is willingly and energetically trying to integrate its schools, while at the same time, all over the country, you have school integration being met in places like Boston with with dozens of violent protests and riots. So it's really remarkable. Absolutely. That both the adoption of the plan was voluntary and the participation in the plan was voluntary. So September 1970 is, I think, the first school year where this plan is in place. Describe those first couple of days at school for for these kids who have now entered new schools and entered more integrated schools. You know, every kid I talk to who is part of this plan all have good memories of it, for of 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 being part of it. The parents who I talked to who were who were volunteered their kids to do this, felt good about themselves. I mean, this is part of the Shaker story during these years. People felt good about themselves. They were like, you know, I, I describe myself as growing up, um, and I was not part of this plan, um, but um, as like holding this kind of superiority trump card in the category of race relations. You know, you guys have race problems, but we've got it figured out here. And that, of course, was never 100% true by by any means. There's like rose-colored glasses with everything, which I'm, we'll get to. But that was the ethos, this idea that we are part of something better. And, and you have to keep in mind, while there also was you know, this violent protest to busing in many communities, this is also at a time when the civil rights movement is raging. And people are thinking about what does that mean for this country? And what does that mean for what's happening in our community? So there were also countervailing positive pressures. If this were a movie, this is where it would end. The camera would pan across a classroom of young faces, some black, some white, all smiling. Text would appear on the screen. The Shaker Heights school system became a beacon for integration around the country. Which is true. The successful integration of Shaker schools was a tremendous achievement. But under the surface, even from the outset, cracks were starting to form. Cracks that have only grown bigger. I'm Kwame Christian, and I am the CEO of the American Negotiation Institute, and I want you to check out my podcast, Negotiate Real Change. Listen to conversations with leaders in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, and learn the secrets behind what it really takes to become a successful advocate, ally, and change maker in your organization. Check out Negotiate Real Change on your favorite podcast player. Hey folks, Rufus here. If you're a fan of our interviews with physicians, scientists, or entrepreneurs, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights and actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in Citro CEO, Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to the show. My guest, Laura Meckler, grew up in Shaker Heights, went out into the world, became an education reporter for the Washington Post, and then she ended up back home writing a book about the place where she was raised. 
And what she found was that despite the successful integration of Shaker schools, at a time when cities around the country were really resisting that, getting black and white students into the same building didn't mean they'd have the same experience. I mentioned the achievement gap at the beginning of this episode. I asked Laura to describe when that started showing up at Shaker schools. The achievement gap, which is a problem just all over the country, is the disparate academic achievement measured by test scores, grades, pretty much any measure based on race. You had white students performing at a higher level than you had Black students. Um, One piece of this achievement gap involved enrollment in upper level classes. So there was a what they called a level system where, you know, level three was regular classes. That's where most kids were supposed to be. Level four was honors. Level five was advanced placement. And then below level three, you'd have like remedial classes and then classes for kids who needed a, real, a lot of help. That system was almost immediately racialized where you mm-hmm. had disproportionate white enrollment in the upper level classes, disproportionate black enrollment in the regular and the lower level classes. There's a lot of theories as to why Shaker Heights and and other racially integrated schools struggle with achievement gaps. Let's talk through a few of them. One problem is that even in a place that embraces integration like Shaker, implicit bias and racism still just show up day in and day out in the classroom. In preparation for our conversation, I watched this 2004 TV documentary that ABC News made about Shaker schools. And I want to play you a clip where a black woman who graduated from Shaker recalls some of the unequal treatment she and her other black peers uh, experienced in class compared to their, their white colleagues. We all studied together. We all read together, did our homework together. But when the white girls handed in their papers, they used to always get A's on their papers. And when we handed in our papers, we used to always get B's or B minuses on our papers. So what we did one time, we wrote our papers and we switched and handed them in under the other's name. And sure enough, came back, the white girls got A's on the papers we had written and we got the B minuses on the papers that they had written. And there's another really striking example of this sort of unequal treatment in your book. It's the story of this young black woman who attended Shaker in the 80s. Her name is Emily Hooper. What was her experience at Shaker High School like? When she gets to high school, she has an experience, which I think is a really good example of the implicit bias that we're talking about here. She's sitting in her American history class. And the teacher says to the class, "Okay, class, let's open our books. And this is what a table of contents is and starts describing the purpose of a table of contents. Emily takes one look at this. She says out loud, "Uh, if we've gotten this far and we don't know what a table of contents is, I think we're all in trouble. And the teacher evidently wasn't having it and sent her to the office. So she goes and talks to a counselor and the counselor's like, well, the only other option we have here is advanced placement U.S. history. And Emily says, "Okay, I'll take that. And she goes into AP U.S. history and has an extraordinary experience there, does very well in that class. And the question has to be asked, you know, why was she not in that class in the first place? Another example with Emily, it's time for her to go ahead and apply for colleges. She tells her counselor that she'd like to apply to Yale. Counselor sort of condescendingly says, oh, sweetie, I just don't think that's going to work out for you. I don't think your grades are good enough. And and she's like, well, I want to apply anyway. And she applies and she's admitted to Yale. She attends Yale. She graduates with honors from Yale. This is a very bright young woman. And yet somehow she's not in that AP U.S. history class to start with. She's discouraged from applying to this school. You know, those are examples of implicit biases at work. I'm sure that counselor didn't think she was doing anything wrong. I'm sure she Mm -hmm. thought she was saving her from some sort of disappointment down the line. But was she giving that same message to a similarly situated white student? You know, one has to ask. So these are these are real issues. I think you were a student at Shaker Heights High School around the same time um, as Emily. I'm a little younger than she is, but yes. What was your experience like? Can you counterpose that with with Emily's? I was in advanced classes and they were mostly white. I mean, it's just that simple. 
And I did notice the fact that these classes were obviously so much wider than the school hallways yeah. and the school itself. Um, and I knew that there was something going on there, but I didn't know what it was. And I think I sort of assumed that, well, you know, there's something here, but everyone's probably getting a good education. There was also the thing that was said at the time out loud by the administration and quietly to, to themselves was that a lot of the black kids were didn't start in the Shaker schools. They started in the city of Cleveland and they came into the Shaker schools. So they weren't as prepared. And in fact, policy was that if you came from Cleveland, you needed to go into a regular level class because clearly you wouldn't be ready for advanced, mm. which is just on its face so wrong. I mean, there might have been kids who that was, I'm sure there were kids that was the case for, but not all kids, not all kids. And yet everybody was just the assumptions were being made, assumptions. I want to share some statistics from your book. These are, I think, from the 90s. I think they're really worth repeating for listeners. Shaker was about 50-50 white and black, yet 95% of students in the lower level classes were black. And in advanced placement, these are the highest level classes you were just describing, only 12% of those students were black. And you also say that that only half of all black students at Shaker took the SAT compared to 90% of white students. And their average score was 300 points lower than their white classmates. It really begins to seem like Shaker Heights High School is actually two schools, right? That there is a school where the white kids get national merit scholarships and go on to Ivy Leagues. And there's a school where the black students don't thrive in the same ways that their their white white colleagues, their white peers are. Is that a fair assessment, do you think? Yeah, I think it is largely fair. Um, there's a couple of things I would add. One is that there were, of course, Black kids who were in the advanced classes. And for them, it was often a very lonely place. Yeah. Sometimes their friends, if they had other Black friends who weren't in those classes, they felt isolated from them. They felt singled out. They felt like people were watching them. So it was uncomfortable and lonely. The second thing is that, you know, I talked to, uh, I was going to ask you what year those statistics were from, but it doesn't matter because there are statistics like that constantly that were reported constantly throughout the years. It could, those numbers could, could have been pulled from just about any year. And the schools were, it's not like they were ignoring it. They were trying a lot of different things to try to address it. I mean, there's a long list of programs and interventions that were attempted, but none of them managed to fix these underlying problems. And I think I mentioned this earlier, you know, there's a lot of theories that get floated as to why these underlying problems exist and, you know, racism and implicit bias like we just discussed. That's one of them. You know, the school administrators are saying, well, maybe part of it is that the black students are doing elementary school education outside of the shaker system. And that's part of it. Uh, various academics, anthropologists come in and study the shaker school system and come up with their own theories of the case, some of them quite controversial. Having now spent five years researching this, interviewing hundreds of people, combing through the archives, do you have any clarity on what the key factors are that that lead to this achievement gap, which we should say exists not only in, in, in Shaker schools, but in diverse schools all across the country? And this is a classic example of both and. It is not just one thing. It is the entire system that we're living with. Um, the former superintendent who presided over many years of dealing with these issues says the only way to close the achievement gap is to eradicate poverty and eliminate racism. I'm not so sure that that's the only way. If that's the only way, I think we're uh, very sobering and depressing because when is that going to happen for real? But I think that there are a a lot of things contributing it to one that you didn't mention is in fact poverty and the fact that the black families living in Shaker have always been less wealthy than the white families and that gap has grown over time. In fact, there is poverty in Shaker Heights, something that would surprise a lot of people who when I would meet and tell them I'm from Shaker would assume I was rich, which in fact, my family was not rich, but we were certainly comfortable. And um, but there is actual poverty in Shaker Heights as well um, today and that those numbers have gone up over time. So when you have families that have enormous needs, economic needs, pressures bearing down on them, it 
just makes everything about school harder. And it's stem to stern. You know, when you show up at school and maybe you didn't get a great night's sleep because you're sharing a bedroom with a sibling or two siblings who are keeping you up at night, or maybe you didn't really have a great dinner the night before, or maybe your parents or parents are working at night and they don't have time to sit down with you or energy to sit down with you to work through your homework. Maybe your parents don't have the same level of education as others have and they don't aren't able to help in the same way. Maybe they don't feel comfortable in school. They had a bad experience in school and walking in those doors is a really uncomfortable situation for them. And so they don't want to go to back to school night because it just feels bad. There are so many reasons that kids who are struggling and from economically um, struggling families are just coming into the door with like a hand tied behind their back. And I don't think we can forget that. So that is a big part of it. And then you add into that these assumptions, this implicit bias, peer pressures, and you just end up with this toxic stew. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important that you mentioned the rising rates of poverty within Shaker. Over the last 30 years, you say in the book, the poverty rate for white Shaker residents uh, went from 1.1% to 3.8%. In the same time, the portion of black Shaker families living in poverty tripled. It went from 5.2% to about 147 Really, really sobering. Let's talk kind of on the ground right now, some of the things they're doing in Shaker Heights High School to try to close this yawning achievement gap. One strategy is is called detracking. How does that work? Well, what tracking is, is when people are put into classes um, based on ability, or as I like to say, perceived ability. In Shaker, it started in a formal way in fifth grade, where kids would be pulled out for enrichment for math and for ELA, English language arts. About half the kids would be pulled for enrichment. The others would be in the regular classes. And you can imagine what the racial makeup of those two groups were. And the kids who were in enriched math would fall right into honors math when they got to middle school and then into the advanced classes all the way up. So that's what tracking is. What detracking is, is disrupting that and combining kids of different ability levels into the same classes. And what does that look like in terms of curriculum or instruction? Like, how does a teacher go about teaching a class where you have students from a really wide range of of abilities? One of the strategies for this is what's called high ceiling, low floor. Everybody's talking about the same thing. Maybe everybody's reading the same book, but different kids are expressing their knowledge in different ways. So maybe one kid's writing a three-page paper and another kid's writing a three-paragraph paper, but they're all writing about the same subject. Maybe what's the theme of this novel? Or perhaps kids are expressing their knowledge through different media. Maybe somebody's doing a panel of graphic novel type panels to show what happened in the book. Somebody else is writing a paper. Somebody else is doing a mini podcast. There's a lot of different ways that people can show their knowledge. And the idea is to is to meet people where they are, but all within the same room. Now, where this gets particularly tricky is in math. It's hard because, you know, th- there is a right answer. It's not just about talking about right. your feelings about the book. And how ha- how's it going? I mean, uh, detracking, my understanding is that it's somewhat controversial, or at least some parents, particularly parents of high achieving students, aren't huge fans of it. Is that is that am I right I on that's that? A- a fair statement. I mean, obviously, there's a diversity of opinion within all groups. There are some parents who support it and others who have real concerns. Um, detracking is very controversial because, first of all, Shaker schools, we've been talking a lot about race, but also over the years, Shaker schools have developed this incredible reputation for academic excellence, being really rigorous. I mean, I experienced that for sure. When I got to college, I mean, I thought college was easier than high school, to be perfectly honest. Wow. Because it was like less competitive. I didn't and I didn't have a bunch of smart kids like right up in my face who everybody knew who got the high score on the test. You were on your own doing what interested you. I was so well prepared. I had had three hour finals for every one of my classes. I mean, it was very academically rigorous in high school. So I was really well prepared for college. And a lot of parents want that. They want their kids well prepared for a traditional academic course. And they fear and with some reason 
that in these detract classrooms, the teacher just cannot push the class as fast and the conversations aren't going to be as in depth as they would be if, if they were in a, a class that was segmented and that only had high achieving kids in it. So there are concerns. Right. And I think it, it forces, I mean, this detracking move, and this is something you talk about in the book, I think it forces, you know, particularly, say, white parents of those high achieving students to really have to wrestle with some very, very deep questions, which is that do you really value integration and are you comfortable seeing changes made to the curriculum so that the school can be more integrated and that classrooms can be more diverse? Or were you actually more comfortable with a system where there were, in fact, two schools and your high achieving white student was able to benefit from, you know, really rigorous curriculum and maybe other students were, were being left behind? That's it in a nutshell. I mean, that's how the administration would put it. They're saying, you know, we're challenging you. You say you believe in this. Everybody who lives in Jager Heights will tell you they moved here because they value diversity. I mean, almost to a person. And they're saying, hey, if you value this, then this is what this is what we need to do to be one community, to be one school. But I, I have, you know, having watched a lot of these classes, having talked to a lot of parents, I don't think it's just either you're, you support detracking, you know, a hundred percent or you're a, you know, you're basking in your white privilege and you're like basically a racist. I mean, I don't think it's that simple. I think you can both support it and want it to be done well. And I hope that Shaker is on its way to doing it well. And I, I know it's something that they're working on. And it seems like there is evidence that when it is done well, it results not only in in more integrated classrooms, but that it actually is is really beneficial for all students. That collaborating with peers uh, across the spectrum of abilities Absolutely. is is good for everyone. Absolutely. It's good for everyone in so many ways. It's good for everyone because if you value diversity, do you also want those in the classroom, different perspectives, different points of view? If you're talking about a novel, let's hear from people who have have a different family, who have a different life experience, even if you live in the same suburb. So there's value to that. There's enormous harm done when you send a message to white kids that you're the smart ones and black kids that you're the dumb ones, which is basically what the old system was doing. That's very harmful to both both people, I would say. And there is also even academic value to this as well. And I, I witnessed this myself. Um, if you are a higher achieving kid and you're in a class with lower achieving kids, well, how is that good for you? Well, sometimes you end up in situations where you're helping explain it to somebody else. And actually doing that solidifies it in your own mind. I was in the eighth grade math class where I happened to just witness this. There was two girls, a black girl and a white girl, that, and the black girl was struggling with this particular problem. The white girl had already finished hers and she was just sitting next to her and she was just sort of gently pointing out to her how you figure out this problem. And I asked her afterwards, like, how did that feel? And she said, it felt good. When you explain it to someone else, it sinks it into your own head. And I think we've all had that experience where you explain it to someone else and then you understand it better too. So there is value to this on many different levels. Or that experience where you try to explain it to someone else because you think you know it so well and you realize in the act of explaining <laughs> it, you have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, which yes. is typically what happens to me. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that, but okay. <laughs> uh, you know, another thing they've been trying at Shaker is more project-based learning. How does that differ from what we think of as sort of the traditional curriculum? It's really interesting. The principal of Shaker Heights High School, his name is Eric Julie. He's bringing a very different spirit to that high school than the, what I experienced when I was a student there. He is talking about different forms of learning. So he wants to see people in a class where they're rebuilding motorcycles. He wants to see them doing podcasting. And he wants to see, instead of necessarily taking a physics class, you're building a rocket and shooting it off. There were, um, there's a, a class of kids learning German and they've partnered with a someone who lives in the community who's shared with them letters that were written during the Holocaust to his family in German, and they're translating those letters. He likes the idea of learning by doing, the idea that, you know, grounding this in the real world. And that is a challenge to how people have thought of Shaker. His view mm -hmm. is, yeah, we're not getting rid of AP classes. We're not getting rid of the IB, the International Baccalaureate Program, which is another sort of crown jewel of the system. So we're keeping all that, but I'm going to provide competition to that. I'm going to put out another course that's going to be super cool. People are going to want to be in that. 
Um, when I asked him, I said, well, is there any value to the traditional idea of read a novel and then write a paper explaining the themes and the character development with quotes to back up your thinking? He said, absolutely, but not every semester for all four years. I began this conversation by saying that Dreamtown contains universal lessons for communities all around the country. And you end the book by saying, quote, Shaker Heights is far from perfect, but it's also far ahead of most of the country and offers lessons for places and people who want to try to do better. If you had to summarize, what would you say those lessons are? Well, the first lesson I would say, and maybe this is the most important one, is that this requires commitment. This is a day in, day out, year in, year out, decade in, decade out commitment to working on these issues because they will always be there, I believe, on some level. So this this problem, in fact, may never be quote unquote solved. Hopefully it's improved. Hopefully we move the ball forward. But that is the most important lesson. There are also other lessons that I think um that are important here. Among them is um, communication and relationships. You have to have a good relationship with your community as a school administration. You have to have trust and support to do hard things. Uh, I tell young reporters or aspiring journalists, you know, that like a, a breaking news story is not the time to develop sources. Well, detracking is not the time to develop relationships. You have to have those relationships in place if you're going to do it well. And you have to communicate to people. And you have to answer the questions that Black and white families have, both supporters and detractors have. And, and you can't blow people off. You have to actually engage with them and help and bring people along. So that that is another lesson, I think. And then I'll, I'll mention one other, which is this idea of belonging. If I could wave a magic wand and do one, make one change, it might be that everybody feels like this is their place and that they belong there. It's really important because if it doesn't feel like this is a place for you, why would you want to be there? If you, and that goes for a black kid sitting by themselves in AP calculus. It goes for a parent walking into back to school night or into a PTO meeting and seeing a bunch of people who don't look like them. It is just really important in terms of creating a sense of community. You have, I think, two kids. I don't know how old they are. They're 14 and 10. Okay, 14 and 10. Is there any part of you that wishes, gosh, I, I wish I lived in Shaker Heights again and, and my kids could experience uh experience Shaker Heights schools? Well, I can tell you my father feels that way. Uh, I, um, yes, I always thought that I would want to, I didn't, I didn't know that I wanted to move back here because I wanted to be a journalist and I wasn't really sure this is the best place to be a journalist, but I always wanted to replicate as much as I could a community like this for myself and for my own kids. And I do wish that my kids could go to this, these schools in many ways. Um, I, I think it would be great. Um, and we, we actually moved back here in the summer of 2021. We spent the entire summer here, um, my husband and me and our kids, um, while I was working on this book. And what was magical about it for me is something small, which is that my dad and stepmom's house, is connected, the backyards all connect behind them mm. um, to houses up and down the block. And there are a bunch of kids who live on the street. And it's a multiracial group of kids, black and white, biracial. And my kids fell right in with this group. They're all playing together every day. And it's a community that looks like Shaker. And it's, it was a wonderful experience for them to have that, to be in this in this moment, to be in this just very natural occurring group of kids just sitting around doing, you know, kicking around a ball and going to the pool and, uh, you know, looking for this groundhog who was eating people's gardens up. And I'm glad, you know, and, and, and the truth is in my neighborhood in Washington, it's mostly white and they don't have that in the same way. Sugar Heights, here I come. Come on up. Just not in February. Come house hunting here in like like June, anywhere from like I'd recommend like May to September. Like you'll 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 sign on the spot. When we come back, we zoom out. How are American schools doing? Hi, I'm Marquina, the business development director here at the Next Big Idea Club. Here's something you probably don't know about the Next Big Idea Club. It's used by hundreds of students at the best business schools in the country, including Harvard, 
Dartmouth, and NYU. And why do they love it? Because ours is the only app in the world that lets you enjoy summaries of the best new books read and written by the authors themselves. We call those summaries Book Bites, and our app has hundreds of them. Plus, we've got audio and video e-courses, conversations with our curators, Malcolm Gladwell, Susan Kane, Adam Grant, and Daniel Pink, and we're adding new stuff every single day. So what are you waiting for? Pause this recording, go over to your app store right now, and download the Next Big Idea app. Or you can follow the link in the episode notes. There's no better way to get smart fast. Just ask those Harvard MBAs. I have one last question for you. You are the Washington Post's national education reporter. So I can't resist asking you just about the state of education in the U.S. a little more broadly. To me, it seems pretty messed up. (laughs) You have uh, Florida banned AP African-American studies and is trying to ban AP psychology. I live in Los Angeles where this spring there were a series of violent protests outside of elementary schools that were having Pride Month assemblies. There was a record number of attempts to ban books in school libraries last year. National test results show that after the pandemic, nine-year-olds have the worst math and reading performance on studies than they've had in 30 years. It seems really grim. Is there anything out there that you see that's giving you hope or making you optimistic? Boy, you really just like, that was like a a turn right there at the end for that question. Now I have to, after all that, I need to give you something optimistic. Um, Wow. Yes, I mean, there always is there, you know, you cover education and you run into teachers who are devoted to their work, principals who are just working their butts off, parents who really care. People care about education. They care about schools and they, they fight so hard for them because they matter. So yes, I think we are at a time of real crisis for education between, as you just summarized, well, the culture war stuff and the COVID recovery, which is we are not recovered from COVID at all. Um, and the, and on top of that, I would mention the social emotional damage, um, like mental health issues are like off the charts these days. So you put all of that together and it is, it is a dim picture, but I think that there are people who are devoted and who are working towards the, um, to make things better on all of these fronts. And you, you can't forget that. So if you need inspiration, you know, just go and actually walk into a classroom and watch somebody doing doing their work and you'll you'll find it. Well, I hope we can make our way out of this dark period in, in school history and maybe Shaker Heights as it did 50 years ago will, will show us the way. Laura Meckler, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Oh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much. Laura Meckler's new book is Dreamtown, Shaker Heights and the Quest for Racial Equity. This show is a proud member of the LinkedIn Podcast Network, as is our other podcast, The Next Big Idea Daily. Have you listened to it? Every week, we get the world's leading thinkers to share nuggets of wisdom in 10 minutes or less. Follow The Next Big Idea Daily wherever you get your podcasts. Today's episode was written and produced by me, Kayla Bissinger, sound designed by Mike Toda. Rufus Griscom is our executive producer. See you next week.